So uh, we have next uh, Jay. Jay um, is um, the vice chair and professor of urology at the first Fox Chase Center at Philadelphia. Here, he has one of the largest experiences in sphincter implantation in the US. And we are so happy to have you here, Jay. And Jay is going to lead us onto the difficult part of this discussion, which is how do you manage a failure or complication of the AUS? Jay. Okay. Um, I, again, want to thank, uh, thank the Bhattikuti Institute uh, in the foundation uh, for the invitation, Dr. Pradhan, um, Dr. Bandari, and uh, the other panelists. I think these are these have been fantastic presentations. And like I've said for um, other master classes, including this one that I've attended, I often learn um, so much just from the the others that are presenting that I take away always several points at least. In, in how we can modify uh, some of our practice here in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I was asked to talk some about an algorithmic approach to manage failure. And I said, I'm happy to do that. And I'll try to be, um, you, you know, somewhat time sensitive in doing it because I know that everyone wants to try to receive their information in a focused manner. Um, here are some of my disclosures. I'll start with saying that the artificial sphincter I, as I alluded to earlier, is in some ways destined to be successful in the overwhelming majority of people, but it's also destined to fail over, over a period of many years. And I have spent a lot of time, I think, as I've uh, done more and more procedures in reconstruction, thinking about what if the, the surgery that I think just went well fails? And, and my concern generally is most surgeries I, I've done, I'd like to think that we did a very good job. And, and there are a proportion of those very good job surgeries, however, that don't result in success. And many times I start to think about that as it relates to the artificial sphincter. Now, the considerations that I try to think about are perhaps who placed the initial device? Was it a less experienced surgeon? Or Really, how did they place it? Maybe where did they place the cuff uh, when they did it? If if I didn't do the original surgery, when was the device placed? Um, is this pa if this patient had leakage from prostate cancer, has the cancer treatment evolved? And in the United States, of course, you know there's healthcare insurance. In other countries, they might not have healthcare insurance that covers artificial sphincter surgery. It might uh, be an out-of-pocket cost. So I think the financial component is important. As well as, you know, if the incontinence is persistent after the AUS or if it's gradual and onset, uh, uh, onset and if there's concomitant urgency. So as you sort of keep these considerations in mind, here are really the, I think, the domain topics that I think about in reoperative AUS. Whether there's persistent incontinence, there's erosion. I think uh, we just talked about this with Vincent. Um, is there a defective device component? And then perhaps I think touched upon by Dr. Joshi is what if there's a concomitant stricture that has been managed in the past and how do we go about managing these patients? So let's take you know a classic patient. My practice I would see is a 74 year old patient. They had a sphincter placed several years ago. Um, there is a four centimeter cuff at that time. Now though the patient is leaking four pads per day and there was a radiation history. How can this be managed? Generally, um, in this scenario, I think there is not one correct answer. Let's start with saying that. There are several correct answers. And one of the answers that was even recently published was perhaps you can try to just alter the balloon. Maybe you uh, upregulate uh, the balloon pressure. And in doing so, this has been published out of the University of Utah. You could decrease the amount of leakage a patient experiences. It's a relatively quick operation. It takes maybe 20 minutes to exchange the balloon. That's one option. Another option is, is well, where exactly was the cuff placed? This is a penoscrotal approach. So this is something that, you know, was a picture given to me by a close colleague, Dr. Wilson, who does a lot of implants as well and helped advance the AUS operation. So maybe it's a penoscrotal approach. Maybe it's a very distal cuff. This shows how many landing spots there are on the urethra for the artificial sphincter cuff. 
And instead of maybe a penis scrotal cuff placement, it can be moved perineally to a more proximal perineal bulbar placement, like perhaps this picture here, and like perhaps some of the videos that Dr. Joshi just showed. And you can see even in a prior bulbar distal cuff placement, that cuff can be moved more proximally. So some of this could be with the balloon, some of this could be with the cuff, and ultimately, some of it has to do with cuff sizing. So I think Dr. Joshi had just uh, discussed this, the three and a half centimeter cuff. What does it show? Could it be done? I think the pediatric population is definitely um, the type of group that should get this. I, you know, was um, uh, helped participate in some of the original studies of the three and a half centimeter cuff. And like most people that develop a new technique or a new surgery, you try to show people that, listen, there is a role for this cuff. And we tried to show the role. One of my uh, close friends and colleagues out of USC, however, years later, published, no, no, listen, that, that cuff, the three and a half centimeter cuff in adults has a higher failure rate. And maybe, maybe it should less be done. And then we too uh, published that perhaps actually the erosion rate in, in an adult patient is actually much higher than the three and a half centimeter cuff. So tighter cuffs result in a greater erosion risk and it's something to consider. Um, you know, in the erosion itself, it's a management conundrum as to how to manage erosion. This is a classic case of a patient that had pain, incontinence, drainage with erosion. Some patients actually have retention because the cuff is eroded. It's occluding uh, urinary passage through the urethra. And, and this, this too was a multi-institutional series that really showed that erosion um, um, can happen in a, in a decreased time actually to erosion in a radiated cohort. So when you have sort of device component visual, uh, visualized within the urinary system, what do you do? Ordinarily, you would think if there's a urethral defect, it's as simple as perhaps placing a few stitches in the urethra. But in reality, this is actually a very challenging operation. Most in, uh, erosion cases where the patient presents sick actually has a very disastrous perineum at the time of reconstruction. Um, but generally, I've come on the side of trying to place urethrals, uh, reapproximating stitches just because it helps the patient develop or maintain urethral patency only for them to perhaps undergo a future AUS. So this was a patient that actually had an erosion. We reapproximated the urethra. And then you can see the urethra is present. The corpora are present. And similar to what Dr. Joshi had presented earlier, this patient, uh, you know, in our center would undergo a transcorporal approach if they had a prior erosion. Um, some because of the challenge in the dissection, but some because, you know, the urethra itself might have some intrinsic weakness from the erosion event. Defective device components occur. And so um, that's something that we'll talk about as well, as is the same with urethral injury at the time of AUS. Here's a really clever paper that I think really suits an international audience. It's something that was done in the United States, but I think it applies to any center, is when you can actually try to diagnose where the leakage occurs within the artificial sphincter system. And the way to do that is to perhaps consider use, utilizing something called an ohm meter. An ohm meter is not terribly expensive. You can see um, this is sold out, you know, recently when I looked for it online, but it's not, a, it's not an incredibly costly um, sort of uh, device for you to purchase. The leads here, the red and black leads can be sterilized in an operating room. And what an ohm meter is really doing is measuring conductance. And you would want the resistance across the tubing to be infinite. But if there's a cuff leak or a tubing leak, or a PRV leak, when you test the various components and you test the tubing alone, you might diagnose sort of a finite amount of resistance. And with a finite amount of resistance, you can diagnose where the cuff leaks. Now, another consideration is to perhaps 
in, in a patient that has persistent incontinence or has developed gradual incontinence is to place a second cuff. Um, so this is called a tandem cuff. My, my general sense, at least in my practice, is to not always, or in many instances, not place a tandem cuff. Many times we have gone towards the tack of removing uh, tandem cuffs and placement of one cuff. Some of this has been backed by uh, the, the literature as well. This is a nice cadaveric study done by another center in the United States at Johns Hopkins, where they measured, again, uh, urethral resistance at, at the level of two cuffs placed in the same cadaver. And what they demonstrated was that the proximal cuff actually was able to maintain continence more and predominant to the second more distal cuff. So the more proximal the cuff goes, as I had demonstrated in an earlier example, perhaps the more success that type of patient would experience. Now, the most unfortunate thing I think that occurs in patients that undergo an artificial sphincter is when you have the intraoperative um, injury of the urethra. If that were to occur sometimes during the dorsal dissection where the urethra is much thinner, it is an erosion risk or frankly uh, should not undergo, the patient should not undergo a simultaneous AUS placement, even if you do fix the urethra. Um, and, and it should be delayed for a future date. At least that is what the company recommends, and that's what I have seen in my experience as well. And generally, I would say in this scenario, this is a patient that did sustain a urethral injury. What we had elected to do in that scenario was to actually place the tape of the um, um, urethral tape around the urethra. And that was something that we could then cut right on to, and you could feel at the time of the revision several months later. And, and it actually preserves the dissection such that you then don't have to re-dissect dorsally to create a two centimeter width for you to then place your artificial sphincter cuff again. Now I've sort of gone through, as I see it, the several concepts that relate to revision. And again, as I've sort of come through with this, different surgeons that do a lot of artificial sphincter have different approaches to how they put everything together. And in my mind, I was asked to present an algorithm and I'll try to do that very carefully. I've thought about this in terms of patients that experience leakage almost immediately or immediately following a device placement, patients that experience gradual incontinence within two years, and then patients that experience gradual incontinence, but it's several years later after the initial placement. And I'll try to go through really three algorithms for that scenario. So, uh, so the first algorithm is the immediately post-operative patient that within several months is experiencing sort of leak. So the first thing I would do in that scenario is a cystoscopy. And generally with cystoscopy, what you will see is three scenarios. You'll see erosion, cuff edema, or you'll see poor coaptation, or you'll see more, uh, unlike uh, you know these three scenarios, you might see sort of what I call an uncommon scenario, and that I would ask you to ask in the chat, and I'm happy to sort of discuss the more uncommon scenario. But I think these are the three common scenarios you'll see um, in these types of patients. Now, you might not see leakage for, uh, if there's cuff edema, but you might have other complaints. The patient might have dysuria, for example. Dysuria, I think, is the most common issue people face um, where they, they might not necessarily have a leakage, but when they're voiding, they face difficulties and they have burning, significant burning. So for each of these scenarios, here's how we would generally manage this. I went over the concept of performing urethral reapproximation and delayed AUS placement for erosion. We talked about the scenario of cuff downsizing, but for cuff edema, we'll probably cuff upsize or balloon down regulate. And very similarly for poor coaptation, we might utilize a tighter cuff um, or more so than balloon upregulation. 
Now there's another scenario, which is when patients develop gradual incontinence within two years. And in that case, I generally test them in the office. Now, if they're able to leak on command, when we ask them to cough, if we stimulate Valsalva voiding or Valsalva incontinence, then, then I will then perform cystoscopy. If, however, they are standing cough negative, we will do urodynamics and cystoscopy. And urodynamics is predominantly to identify urgency and to manage urgency accordingly. With cystoscopy, it becomes somewhat of a goal to identify if there's co good coaptation or not of the artificial sphincter cuff. Now, if there's erosion, that would be managed with you know, device removal, as I just discussed. But ordinarily, it's a poor coaptation that you'll see in these patients. And generally, I would go towards performing an ultrasound of the PRB. If the PRB is full, we would likely increase the pressure to the PRB. And less likely, we would reposition the cuff or downsize the cuff. If the PRB was completely empty, in that scenario, we would do a complete device component exchange, or we would consider the ohm meter assessment that I just talked about. Now, in a greater than two-year patient, it's very similar. We would stand the patient, have them cough, perform urodynamics, or perform cystoscopy alone. And if we do, do cystoscopy alone, again, the two most common things you're going to see is either erosion or poor coaptation. And if you see erosion, that will get managed with device removal. If you see poor coaptation, it'll be complete device exchange. And the only reason why we would do complete device exchange greater than several years out is because I already presented to you the data that the failure rate of the artificial sphincter is, is higher. That you know, in seven to eight years, the entire device is at risk of failing on average. So if it's already been several years, our center tends to do a complete device removal and replacement. I think, again, it's been exciting for me to participate here, and I really hope that my talk gave some clarity on the algorithms that we use to manage these types of patients. I'll say in closing that the AU, AUS remains a gold standard. We have taken the tact of avoiding a double cuffs as well as very tight cuffs, three and a half centimeter cuffs, again, in the adult population. An algorithmic approach, I think, helps optimize the patient care, the survival of the device, and everyone's overall satisfaction. Thank you again for the invitation and opportunity to present today. Jay, that was outstanding. You really sort of simplified your thought process in these difficult situations which we all face. I thank you very much for an excellent uh, disposition.